many differences between what we are trying to refer to with the term natural capital and economic capital that I don't understand the value of calling them both capital. I mean, it's, 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 it's intuitively uh, attractive, but I'm not certain that it's conceptually clear. Oh, you're talking about can you make money restoring natural capital? Right. 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 There is a yeah. There is the possibility of making profit from ecological restoration. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wouldn't say that's impossible. In, in most cases, that market is created by the infusion of lots of government money. Right. And they create grants programs or, or other kinds of funds to uh, spur that kind of activity. It's basically a public sector activity rather than private. There's also a question of if you, if it's privately produced, who owns it when it's done? Generally speaking, you won't be restoring something that is then going to become simply public property or common property. Um, the very act of having produced it will, will legally entrain the notion that it belongs to you. Yeah. So he's just sort of a theorizing on, on sort of an ideal solution to problems, but like thinking outside the reality of how our uh, economy interacts with people. Well, well, not necessarily. Like if you take solar energy companies or like you know, like amounts of property or whatever they're they're capitalizing on the, the, the solutions to. Does solar energy represent? You see, um, I don't dispute that generating electricity from solar rather than from coal is environmentally preferable. But, I, but those who think that growth in the solar sector will reduce production of electricity from coal with no other steps being taken, I, I don't buy it. I mean, the, the, the historical and actually theoretical evidence as well suggests that if you add solar to the existing mix of power, you know, energy that's available, what you're essentially doing is making energy cheaper by, by increasing the supply. And every time energy gets cheaper, we use more of it. And in the long run, we use more, not only more, but more than we might have otherwise. In other words, um, we actually, if you make, the, the more efficient we get at using energy, the more we use per capita because it's cheaper per unit. That's Jevons' paradox. And in other words, that alone, I mean, you can't, you can't expect coal-fired electricity to go down without either coal getting really expensive or laws that say you can't, you can't do as much of it. Jevons. J-E-V-O-N-S. Yeah. <laughs> the, qu the question being put forward is, is um, so transnational or global scale entities, private or some of these non-profit or, or non-governmental entities, um, are, they, are they, I believe that's fair to say, you're suggesting that they might create problems just by virtue of their scale? Okay. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm quite following you, but um, I mean, I think when he says reform trade policy, he's actually pointing at some of the things you're talking about. I mean, he's suggesting that the WTO is part of the problem, not part of the solution, um, which would imply that free trade is part of the problem, not part of the solution. Um, so I'm not certain that Costanza would run afoul of that just here. He doesn't provide very much sale in this piece. It's an essay that's fairly short. Um, I guess another way of putting what I'm getting at here. Yeah, go ahead. What if environmentalists go for a walk in the desert and wait for everything to crash? How do we know when it's just about to crash? We'll come back in from the wilderness at that point? It sounds way too millenarian to me. I mean, these kinds of things have been going on for thousands of years, people predicting the end of time or the end of whatever. And then um, the problem is that the predictions don't come true, and then they have to figure out how to save face. Um, I, 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 the point I'm trying to drive home here, perhaps, is best expressed this way. That is, um, remember, Smith and Marx alike emphasized that there was something very different going on after the Industrial Revolution with the rise of capitalism. Marx especially was very, very explicit about this. His theory of value, as I said, is not intended to be universal, right? It's not intended to be trans-historical. It's not supposed to apply to every society everywhere. It's only supposed to apply to capitalist society. It's a, he, he claims that in capitalist society, value in the, defined this way is the important thing going on. And he insists that it's, it's unique and different and weird. His theory of capital is built on that theory of value. In other words, his theory about why capitalism leads to various ills, inequality and degradation of resources, is, is specific to capitalism. And to that extent, is, a, is grounded historically. The, the theory of natural capital, as propounded by people like Costanza, is not grounded in any historical period at all. It's a, it's a universal or, or trans-historical theory of capital, according to which capital is anything that produces well-being for people. Right? Capital is essentially defined as whatever it is that generates use value. And there's no mention made of the distinction between use value and exchange value. There's no mention made of exactly how those things have to come together in order to function as capital. And I worry that a trans-historical theory of capital to make natural capital into some kind of concept, um, in fact, can't get at or glosses over the specific dynamics at work here, even though Costanza is quite clearly aware of, and so are the people writing the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, they're very, very, very well aware that the industrial capitalist period since whenever, 1800, 1780, 1820, whatever you want to date it, um, has seen the rise of an entirely different kind of society and economy than, than has ever been seen before. And even though they recognize that that is somehow very much at the center of the problems that they're describing. And it, it seems to me that um, a, a, a theory of capital that is not grounded in the specific dynamics of that period of time is not likely to shed the kinds of insights that we need to deal with what's going on now. And, and, but it's not clear to me how you define natural capital without trans-historicizing it. Does that make sense? Sort of? All right, let's take a five minute break and then I'll give you the next lecture.
OK. So now I'm going to try to give lecture 12 in its entirety in 26 minutes, or 36 minutes, I'm sorry, so that we can get back on schedule. Um, and the reading for today, I don't know how many of you had a chance to do it, you know, given that you're probably working on your midterms. The reading for today is the first 60 pages of Late Victorian Holocaust by Mike Davis. Um, El Nino famous in the making of the third world. I'm going to cover those 60 pages here to, in this lecture. On Thursday, I will cover the rest of the readings from Davis's book, OK? But first, I'm going to run a quick review. And think of this as, OK, we just put the midterm behind us. Where are we at? And before we sort of move forward with the rest of the semester. Um, I'll skip these. These are just some newspaper articles from a few years ago. I don't think we have time right now. So review. This is a class about population and natural resources. We're looking at how humans are sustained by the Earth, what impacts humans have on the Earth, and how are these relationships mediated socially, economically, ecologically, politically, culturally, OK? Are there limits? to the amount of food, energy, water, to the climate system, to simple space for all of us, to fertile soil, genetic diversity, disease, war, ecosystem processes. These are some of the questions we're looking at. If there are limits, what are they and how do they function? Are they fixed or do they change? How do they interact with each other? Are they uniform or are they socially and geographically differentiated? Are they linear or abrupt? Are they reversible? These are the kinds of questions that we're interested in trying to answer. We are now going to look more carefully the rest of the semester at this question. What are the effects of invoking limits? In other words, independently of whether there are sort of objective limits to various natural resources, what are the effects of saying that there are, of declaring that we have reached some kind of limit or that we are about to reach some kind of limit, and of saying that this limit must be somehow abided, we have to somehow live within it, we need to um, act to prevent some kind of calamity that would occur if we exceeded some kind of limit. We've already seen this to some degree in the case of Malthus and the poor laws. The ways in which, I mean, Malthus was basically writing in the debate about the poor laws. He was looking to advance a policy position, and he used the idea of limits and the principle of population as a way of supporting his argument for the abolition of the poor laws. So that's one example. We're going to look, Davis's book is a look at the question of the British in India, especially in the last half of the 19th century, where ideas of limits and many of Malthus's theories were used to essentially justify doing nothing in the face of massive famine. Agricultural research and the Green Revolution, which we will look at to some degree further on this semester, is another example where huge changes, um, including both aggressive research programs funded by the government and then development programs in third world agricultural settings, have been justified on the grounds that the world is running out of food. And the only way to meet the crisis is to convert the agricultural systems of the rest of the world on the model developed principally in the United States to modernize, mechanize, industrialize the production of food to ensure that we don't run out of food. So again, invoking the specter of limits can have very powerful political consequences. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment and the idea of marketizing ecosystem services could be seen as another example, right? Here is a comprehensive report generated by thousands of the world's top scientists telling us that ecosystem services are basically being annihilated and that we must act to save them. And the implication is that marketizing these ecosystem services is our best solution or is somehow necessary to ensuring that we do not exceed these limits, that we do not render the planet unfit for ourselves. And then the tragedy of the commons is perhaps the most famous example. Um, <clears throat> I don't actually put the article, The Tragedy of the Commons, by Garrett Hardin on the syllabus until the very end of the semester. And the reason I do that is that if I put it at the beginning of the semester, I spend the rest of the semester having to reiterate its flaws over and over and over again. But it's a very famous article in which Hardin basically said, the world is exceeding its, we are exceeding the carrying capacity of the earth for humans. There are too many people on this earth. And he said the only moral thing to do is to force people to have fewer kids. And when we get to Fatal Misconception, the Matthew Connolly book, we will actually go back to India in the 20th century, and we will see some of the policy consequences of that type of thinking, the Garrett Hardin tragedy of the commons type of thinking. Um, Hardin was not, I mean, he did a particularly eloquent job of articulating his position. It's one of the most cited papers in the history of the journal Science. But he wasn't saying anything that wasn't already out and about in the world of people concerned about overpopulation. Um, and it is, you know, it's the kind of argument that somehow still grips people's minds, kind of like Malthus, no matter how many times you point out that it doesn't make sense. So you're not allowed to read it till the end of the semester, OK? <clears throat> who suffers, who benefits, and why when limits are invoked? What is to be done? A couple of general summary points thus far. In the 18th century, in the years leading up to when Malthus wrote his essay, and at the time when Adam Smith wrote, the earth was perceived as abundant, bounteous, and unlimited in its wealth. And as you saw in Malthus, the United States of America was seen as sort of like proof of this. There's just an endless amount of land and resources out there. Why should we be worried? Malthus turned against that thinking. He said, no, the earth is limited. Natural scarcity imposes misery and vice. That scarcity went on to become the sort of defining concept of economics. Economics is about resource allocation in the, in the context of scarcity. But are these limits economic or ecological? Are they human or natural? Are they relative or absolute? The general Malthusian view is that scarcities are imposed by nature, such as droughts, crop failures, natural disasters, resource depletion, population growth. You might put epidemic diseases in there as well. They are best overcome through the market by the use of price signals, innovation, division of labor, and trade. People without jobs or income are redundant, and overpopulation is the problem. We've seen this so far. And here we get the images that almost invariably come from third world settings, or at least not white settings, in which you see these images of there are too many people in the world. The Marxian view, on the other side, Suggest that scarcities are not somehow just a function of nature. They are socially produced. Marx in particular is going to say they are socially produced by private property of the means of production as an institution. They are intrinsic to capitalist markets, not intrinsic to nature. People without jobs or income are produced by and contribute to the maintenance of capitalism. And the specter of scarcity is an ideological weapon. And as I think I may have mentioned once before, Marx is going to look at any situation of scarcity and say, well, scarcity relative to what? Scarcity is not scarcity unless it is scarcity of one thing relative to another. And you might just as well turn around and say, it's not that there's too little of this, it's that there's too much of that. So anytime you say scarcity, you can also turn around and say, no, it's actually surplus. It's a situation of excess of something creating an imbalance, which viewed from one side looks like scarcity, but viewed from another position looks like surplus. So we might look at pictures such as these. 
in which the number of people seems small, the amount of space seems great, the amount of capital invested is enormous on a per capita basis, and ask how are these related to the pictures we saw before in which there appear to be too many people. Here it would have almost um, looked like there's too few or blissfully few or something like that. Um, nonetheless, these are basically two sides of the same coin rather than unrelated phenomena. That's the argument that Marx and Davis, for that matter, are, are make, do make, are making, are going to make. Davis's argument in a nutshell is that the first world and the third world were co-produced. The wealth of one extracted from the other in the period between roughly 1860 and 1920. And he's going to focus on India in particular, but if you read the whole book, he also talks about many other parts of the world. Finally, the state and the market. The state imposes and enforces property laws. That's one of its key defining characteristic features. Other authorities and norms must be subordinated if the state's to rule over property if the laws of property are to, are to work. This requires boundaries both between and within states. These boundaries must be territorially exhaustive. There can be no outside. There can be no place that is not the sovereign territory of some clearly defined constituted state. This creates free laborers and the spatial framework for competition and accumulation. A lot of what we're going to look at in Davis concerns how a non-capitalist system and economy changes when it is brought into contact and articulation with a capitalist one. In other words, what happens to the Indian peasantry when it becomes integrated through markets into the global production of agricultural goods? and in this case integrated through the activities of the British. And one of the things that happens is that the territorial space gets bounded, the state imposes its property rules and its laws of taxation, and that creates certain norms that the people in those settings have got to meet and turns them from peasant agricultural producers into free laborers in the Marxian sense of the word, people who must sell their labor to make a living. Okay, and this is the reading for today. And for Thursday, other questions based on that little, well, that was 10 minutes summary of where we are and where we're going. Okay.